thank you everyone for joining us for this very timely webinar on challenges facing the Irish electricity grid in terms of security supply and the potential role nuclear power could play in this in the future. Nuclear power, as you may know, is currently prohibited in Ireland under two pieces of legislation, the 1999 Electricity Regulation Act and the 2006 Strategic Infrastructure Act. The effective ban on nuclear power is contained in two simple paragraphs that could easily be removed by a dull vote. We urgently need to assess all energy technologies for the role they may play in an affordable, clean and stable future Irish electricity grid. However, until the ban on nuclear power is lifted, it is not possible for it to be assessed on equal footing with other technologies for how it could help our electricity system. Given the urgent nature of this conversation and the 12 plus year time span it would take to begin producing electricity in an Irish nuclear power plant, it is essential that we have this conversation now about what we need from our future energy system and how that can be provided. 18 for Zero is a voluntary group of energy sector professionals advocating for the repeal of this legislation to enable this conversation. In today's discussion, Kieran uh, O'Brien will discuss challenges facing the Irish electricity grid in terms of security supply, and Mark Nelson will discuss how nuclear power may address them. Some quick housekeeping. Um, this session is being recorded, and this recording will become available in the coming days. Both speakers will speak for 15 minutes, and the remaining 30 minutes will be for Q&A. During the event, you can put your questions into the chat box and make sure to state who the question is for. Please keep the questions relevant to the topic of today's discussion, and I will read out as many questions for the speakers as we have time for. Please feel free to contact us after this event with any questions you have for 18 for Zero. Also, very importantly, please keep yourselves on mute for the duration of the webinar. Due to the large number of attendees expected tonight, if you take yourselves off mute, we may have to remove you from the event. If you're having any difficulties, please me message a member of 18 for Zero and we'll do our best to help. So, um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, um, Kieran O'Brien. Let me just one second. Um, Kieran uh, uh, was the managing director of ESB National Grid, now AirGrid, for eleven years. He is a member of the Irish Academy of Engineering and lead author of the March 2021 report um, on the National Energy and Climate Plan: The Challenge of a high level renewable generation in Ireland's electricity system and, and their September 2021 report on the reliability and affordability of Irish electricity transition up to 2030. Kieran. Good evening, everybody. Sarah has given me 15 minutes to present a quite complex topic and warn me of dire consequences for non-compliance. Now, the Irish Academy of Engineering has published several papers recently on this evening's topic. These are all available on the Academy's website. I'm going to skate over some quite complex issues, but I'll be happy to respond to questions later. Power systems are judged by two important parameters. Adequacy, can the system meet demand? Is there enough generation available at any time to satisfy all electricity customers? And resilience, can the system withstand sudden shocks? This evening's discussion will be confined to adequacy. Next slide, please. I want to discuss the adequacy of our Irish power system to meet peak electricity demand over three timescales, immediately, the winter 2021, medium term, up to 2030, and long term, 2030 to 2050. Next slide, please. The Irish power system has experienced an increasing number of amber alerts over the past six months, and these are warnings of low margins between supply and demand and a possibility of power cuts if the situation worsens. Now, media folks like to warn of blackouts. In fact, that term has been used for this evening's discussion, and this is what happens when the complete power system goes down. It has happened in many countries, but never in Ireland, and is unlikely to happen here in the short term, in my view. Blackouts are associated primarily with resilience failures. That's a discussion for another day. But we have had load shedding or power cuts, and that in itself is a major issue which every power system operator strives to avoid. Uh, simple reasons have been advanced for the amber alerts. We have had a low wind regime for many months. We have experienced decreasing reliability of our <clears throat> power plant fleet, and this is true. And we have had two significant generating plant outages at the same time, and this is also true. Next slide, please. Based on the foregoing, Airgrid has been instructed to lease several hundred megawatts of emergency generation. These are large generators that are fueled by gas and arrive on the backs of trucks. They need quite a lot of work and site preparation and connection to the grid, and they are to be returned when the emergency is over. They are rented. 
We have never resorted to renting generators before. The last time I discussed leasing generating units for the short term, I was doing consultancy work in Lebanon. But established, professionally managed power systems do not resort to this kind of fix because they know how to plan for a new capacity and make sure they are ahead of the game. So what really went wrong? Next slide, please. Let's review what happened. First, we have to plan for system adequacy. Here's the approach. Please don't worry about the detail. You have to estimate future demand. List the generating units on the system. Establish reasonable outage rates for each unit. Carry out a simulated computerized system dispatch for every half hour of the next 10 years. Then vary the availability rates and carry out tens of thousands of statistical simulations, the so-called Monte Carlo method. And based on this modeling, establish the likely number of hours per year when the system might fail to meet demand. That's called a loss of load expectation, or L-O-L-E. Uh, compare this with accepted standards. I think the standard is still eight hours per year, and plan for new generation to meet the standard if required. Now, what we do not do is sit at a desk wondering if two units might be simultaneously unavailable because this event and hundreds of others like it are already incorporated in the above methodology. So did this happen? Yes, it did. Airgrid carries out this exercise on an annual basis and publishes a generation capacity statement each year. And yes, that statement identified a requirement for new gas fire generation. Now, adding generation to the system is not Airgrid's business. In fact, it is specifically and correctly excluded from being involved in the generation business. Generation is now added to the system using an auction process, and the main decisions are taken by our regulatory body, the Commission for Regulation of Utilities, the CRU. And last year, the CRU instructed Airgrid to hold an auction for a specified amount of generation. Next slide, please. I understand that while the auction initially appeared successful, it ultimately failed to deliver the required number of megawatt, megawatts. And that is why we are resorting to leasing emergency generation. Money Point Coal Fired Power Station, scheduled for decommissioning in four years' time, operated flat out last week in order to keep the lights on. And large industrial investors are scratching their heads and wondering what became of the power system which they had comfortably relied on for decades. There are two important questions. Why did the auction process fail? Why did we not attract sufficient interest from generators? And two, will the next auction, due early next year, succeed? Now, sadly, I have no answer to either of these questions. In the meantime, roll on emergency generation. Next slide, please. Let me now turn to the medium term. Based on scientific advice, the government has decided to engage in the most radical reform of our power system ever attempted. The government has set targets for both 2030 and 2050, and here I'm dealing with 2030 targets. For example, 70% of electricity from renewables, many thousands of megawatts of onshore and offshore wind generation, large social, solar energy generation facilities, and lots and lots of electric vehicles and heat pumps for home heating. I won't say much on this topic this evening. Please note that as engineers, we do not claim any competence in climate science and we fully accept these targets. We are, however, very conscious that setting targets is relatively easy. Coming up with a plan to achieve those targets is much, much more difficult. Next slide, please. We have asked time and again to see the plan. It appears that there isn't one. A planning process started in 2019 and we are assured that it will finish next year. At a time of unprecedented change in our power industry, it seems to the Academy that taking two and a half years to produce a plan is a trifle excessive. A proper plan would address the following issues. Establish a detailed capital investment program for the next decade. Identify the cost of such a program and the likely sources of capital, public versus private, for example. Confirm the savings in fuel, for example, resulting from the investment. Model ongoing operational and maintenance costs. Identify the impact on energy consumers and taxpayers. Identify any significant barriers to the investment program and suggest remedial actions in advance. Changes for planning legislation, for example. I'm on now, Judy. You don't have to shout. Oh, I didn't know. It's okay. Um, can everyone please ensure that they're muted? Sorry, Karen, please continue. The ongoing absence of such a plan is a matter of great concern to the Academy. Some preliminary modelling has been done and has established that we will need significantly increased gas fired generation to back up the large amount of new wind capacity when the wind doesn't blow, as it didn't for much of this year. I'm going to assume that the current auction problems will be solved. 
and that we will plan for and install adequate gas fire generation to maintain system adequacy in 2030. The CRU has confirmed that we need at least 2,000 megawatts of new gas fire generation in short order. We anxiously await some progress on this. But what about the gas supply? Next slide, please. On average, we will use less gas with all that wind generation, but our peak gas demand when the wind doesn't blow will increase. And where will it come from? Coral will close in a few years. North Sea gas production will decline rapidly over the next decade. The UK estimates that it will, that it will import 75% of its gas by 2030. We will be at the end of a very long supply chain. All European countries in this position, Spain, Portugal, France, the Low Countries, Italy, and of course the UK, have constructed their own facilities to import liquefied natural gas, or LNG. We are the only outlier. Now, the Academy is extremely concerned at the country's strategic vulnerability to gas supply disruption in 2030. Remember, it would not just be the gas industry that might be affected, it would also seriously compromise our power industry. And for that reason, the Academy believes that the government should encourage the construction of an LNG import facility on the island of Ireland. Yes, we are aware of objections to the importation of fracked gas. That's gas produced by a process called hydraulic fracturing. It is almost entirely confined to US produced gas. Practically all other gas traded in the world does not involve hydraulic fracturing. The Academy sees no reason why the license of an Irish LNG plant should not be conditioned to prevent the importation of fracked gas if this continues to be a concern. It is estimated that US LNG supplies constitute around 20% of European LNG imports. Since we are connected to the European gas grid, we are already using fracked gas in Ireland. Next slide, please. Before we leave 2030, a word about transmission. If we want to connect thousands of megawatts of new renewables to the power system, we must reinforce the transmission network to get that power to where it is consumed. Yet major projects like the North-South Interconnector, the new 400 kV substation in Leash, have been at planning stages for decades, and there is no indication that they can or will ever be constructed. And this is not a matter of technology or finance, it's a matter of social acceptability. If this infrastructure is to be built, then experience in Denmark and Germany demonstrates that it cannot be left to technical outfits like, like Airgrid or the network owner ESB. It demands strong political leadership actively supporting such projects, and there is little or no evidence of this in Ireland, often quite the opposite, strong political opposition. If this issue is not confronted in the academies of the view that the 2030 targets set by government cannot be achieved. Now, a brief word about interconnectors. The Academy believes they are an excellent idea and will increase the resilience of Ireland's power system as well as reducing the cost of electricity. But their role in solving adequacy problems in an Irish system powered principally by wind must be questioned. A little over two weeks ago, that's Monday the 6th to be precise, there was an amber alert on the Irish power system due to low wind levels. Airgrid did what any responsible system operator would do and contacted the UK system operator to arrange for transfer on the interconnector if required. But lo and behold, the UK system operator was just about to proverbially, proverbially lift the phone to his Irish counterpart because he was also experiencing a lack of wind power. Both system operators met their peak demand on that day, but I understand that the interconnector transfer capacity was set to zero in both directions. Next slide, please. This is entirely predictable. Low wind periods are associated with stationary high pressure weather systems. And these are stationary, not just over Ireland, but over the whole of Northwest Europe. Just look at this typical chart. When we are short of wind power, almost certainly the UK, the low countries, and possibly Denmark and Germany will be in exactly the same situation. So professional planners like Airgrid derate the interconnectors in these circumstances. In the most recent generating capacity statement, the derating factor was 40%. And bear in mind that yesterday fortnight, the actual derating amounted to 100%. This is a variable that has yet to be reliably determined and is of considerable concern to the Academy. Just how much can we depend on interconnectors to solve system adequacy problems we really don't know? Now, let's have a quick look beyond 2030. Next slide, please. 
Now we can contemplate the potential for new technologies, and here are some options. I'm not going to go through this list in the time available. Uh, the first comment is that none of these options will be available at any scale by 2030. They're not relevant to medium-term targets. Storage solutions for our adequacy issues are generally too expensive, even allowing for the projected fall in battery prices by 2030. Ireland's geology does not generally support gas storage, although there is one potential site at Island McGee and County Antrim, and encouraging development of this site would probably be a sensible idea. Batteries will play a significant role in solving resilience problems, but we just can't afford them on a scale that would help with adequacy. Hydrogen is likely to become an energy vector, but perhaps not as widespread, at least initially, as some would currently predict. It would seem to have particular relevance in the area of heavy transport and shipping, which brings me very briefly to nuclear power. Nuclear power currently supplies more electricity worldwide than all the wind generators and solar panels combined. It may have become unpopular in many Western countries following the Fukushima accident, but it has been steadily developed in China and lately in the Middle East. Uh, there are two development tracks for the technology, ever increasing scale, 1500 megawatt unit size, for example, in order to bring costs down. And the uh, example there would be the new Hinkley Point plant in the UK. The other approach is through small modular reactors, 100 megawatts to 300 megawatts, which are being developed in several countries with a view to mass producing components in factories rather than commence large new construction projects each time. Now, neither technology is relevant for Ireland prior to 2030, and the large project approach is never going to be a runner in a small power system like Ireland's. However, small modular reactors hold out a lot of promise and would likely make a very helpful contribution in Ireland in the longer term if they were legal. At present, such technology is banned by law in Ireland. Now, changing the situation would require a major effort of political leadership, and in the academy, we don't see a lot of evidence of this. However, Ireland does not have its own atmosphere, and the deployment of this technology anywhere will be positive for the planet. We can uphold our non-nuclear principles and still benefit from a free ride. And we could import that electricity, and indeed it could assist significantly in solving the adequacy problems. Uh, just a further example, I guess, to quote the late Charles Hahi of an Irish solution to an Irish problem. Next slide, please. So, to summarise, please fix the generation auction process and let us try and recover some credibility with large international companies contemplating investment in Ireland. Please carefully consider the strategic vulnerability of Ireland's future gas supply and consider strongly the possibility of encouraging an LNG import facility. Please demonstrate some political leadership when it comes to constructing necessary transmission infrastructure. Please consider the limitations of interconnection when it comes to maintaining adequacy in, West, in a Western European region heavily dependent on wind power. Please carefully consider the possible advantages of a long-term nuclear power option. And please, please give us a plan for the most important energy transition we have ever contemplated. Finally, to paraphrase the immortal words of the late David McKay, can we please have more numbers and fewer adjectives? Next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much, Kieran, for that. That was very interesting. Um, I'm sure I missed a few bits. I'm going to have to rewatch when the video becomes live. Um, there was so much content to that. Um, just in case anyone's wondering, um, I asked people to please put their questions into the chat box. I've been told we're having a few technical difficulties with that. So please hold on to your questions um, until we have that sorted. And we'll be asking them in the Q&A session after both speakers are done. Um, now I'd like to hand the floor over to Mark Nelson. Um, Mark Nelson has a Master's of Philosophy in Nuclear Engineering from Cambridge University and he's the Managing Director of Radiant Energy Fund and former Senior Analyst at, the Envir at Environmental Progress. He is a leading researcher and voice on nuclear power and grid systems, having produced many reports on the performance of grid systems with and without nuclear power. Mark. Mark, you're muted. I could have sworn that those days of talking into a muted microphone were done, but I guess it's always the pandemic. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for having me join from far away. Um, I'm going to talk about a few very specific, interesting developments recently in the United States, specifically with Texas. 
Um, I want to just comment on Karen. Um, you are begging for a fix to your capa your capacity auctions. I have news from the United States. I don't think anywhere has figured out the capacity auctions in a way that works for new investment per se. Um, uh, as far as I know, this experiment over the last 25 years with the electricity markets um, is, is, in my opinion, coming to some kind of conclusion. The earliest electricity markets are suffering the worst crises. So, for example, um, very early market in the UK has almost completely failed to deliver uh, new capacity without outside intervention. The markets in Texas and California are uh, not healthy, to say the very least. And if there is some kind of fix that works, it is not clear where or how it can come from in anything that resembles uh, an auction-based system. Because as you know, the location and the type of the capacity being provided is not something that can be summarizable by a direct dollar to dollar comparison in the or euro to euro comparison on the bids. So I'm sure people may have questions about that later. Let's get into Texas. In Texas, uh, my judgments and my writings that said that something was going wrong in Texas and more generally with the addition of renewables onto grids was thrown back into my face repeatedly. I was told that I was wrong, that renewables have an effect of making electricity more expensive, specifically because Texas had something like one, uh, one quarter to one third of all American wind installed in one state. And therefore, it was an example where if things were going right in Texas, it was clear that that was a, a future direction that agreed with the professors and the think tank saying that wind and solar was the cheapest energy cost. I was having difficulty because I was saying, you may say wind and solar is cheap, but I promise you, Texas's cheap prices are probably hiding some great difficulty. And of course, it looks ridiculous until we had a cold spell for four days from February 15th to 18th, 2021. Here's what happened. A very large mass of very still, very cold air came down from Canada and it just sat on top of the center part of the United States. What this meant for wind production is from um, from central Canada all the way to the south of Texas. There was uh, essentially no wind production for several periods over a series of days and very low wind production on average um, when all those four days were spoken for. And that's for not just Texas, but all the way up to the northern part of the United States and Canada. The way this was experienced by the power system in Texas is that as the evening of the 14th and the very early morning hours of the 15th arrived, wind fell to almost nothing. Solar was, of course, gone. And then quickly, there was a cascading set of failures in the natural gas delivery system and the natural gas generation system. This followed uh, power cuts that started to exacerbate the, the loss of energy because there were pumping and compressor stations for natural gas production areas that were not registered as being on a non-interruptible highest priority circuits. So when the grid operator was choosing between hospitals in San Antonio and some random areas in West Texas, they accidentally shut off some of the machines that supplied the natural gas and the generators themselves began to run out of power. So to summarize the losses, about 200 lives and approximately 100 to 200 billion dollars of economic losses were suffered in terms of electricity trade for four days straight. The power market, ERCOT, saw maximum prices up at the, uh, I believe, 9,000 per megawatt hour for continuously during the area of time of lost load. That was a decision taken under the authority of the grid operators. They had the authority to do that. Their perspective was this. Natural gas deals would be going constantly in phone, with phones in the background. And if suppliers could obtain extremely expensive natural gas emergency lead, delivered. The grid operator wanted to be absolutely certain that led to immediate decisions to run natural gas generators at any price. And so that's why the, the power, the market price was pegged up at $9,000 per megawatt hour. What this meant was in four days, 
the total transacted amount of electricity was about $50 billion USD for one state. Um, this was equal to the previous three and a half years combined of electricity uh, contracting in the state of Texas, all in four days. About uh, 18 gigawatts on average of power was dropped during those four days, with as high as 23 gigawatts missing, according to projections versus available to be delivered power. So almost immediately, the issue was politicized. Now, of course, there were many people who blamed the wind turbines and said, this is why we need more natural gas. The nuclear industry was briefly quite happy because they were going to say, see, we're very reliable. But then one, one of four nuclear reactors went down and stayed off for many of the days of the crisis, which led to the nuclear industry quite, quieting down and not saying much. The important legacy here is that the mainstream narrative on the center and the center left of American media, that is the line being taken by New York Times, is essentially a lie. It's the following. It was not the fault of wind that this occurred because the amount of power lost was biggest from natural gas and really all power sources failed, coal, gas, and nuclear. So that's the line. All power sources failed. There's the non-numbers line, as uh, Karen complained about. The, no, the non-numbers line is all energy sources failed. That's one. Two, natural gas failed most. So the main thing I want to say with the, ne with the last five minutes of my talk is why this is a particularly dangerous misrepresentation and where to look out for this misrepresentation in your system after the wind droughts of September 2021 and August 2021 of this year. The claim that wind overproduced or that wind was meant to fail is not actually accurate. There was about 28 gigawatts of wind on the ERCOT system, 28 gigawatts. The expected winter adequacy reports said that during peak winter hours, seven gigawatts should be expected. Then, when did you meet her? Uh, more reports said. Apologies, yeah, Mark. Um, no. Can I just remind everyone to please keep yourselves on mute? Thank you very much. Sorry, continue. Uh, all right. So the lowest, the average value actually delivered was about half of that seven gigawatts. It's, it's around 3.3, uh, I believe, mid threes in number of gigawatts delivered on average. What this means is that in order to say that wind overproduced, people have now retreated to say there's a special report that says in an extreme low wind situation, in a wind emergency, how much wind should be expected in order to ensure resource advocacy requirements are met? Well, ERCOT's report going into this winter are that about 2.8, 2.9, around 3 gigawatts of wind should be expected in the most severe and extreme event. The reason why this is a very dangerous misrepresentation in the New York Times and among energy experts in general in the United States is that the key figure is not the average during four days of blackout, it's the extreme low value. And unfortunately, in Texas, wind fell all the way down to a lowest hourly value of about 700 megawatts or about 0.7 gigawatts. That is about a quarter of the amount expected during the most extreme projected emergency event uh, assessed by the grid operator going into winter. I have another complaint about this uh, claim that wind overproduced, considering it during the most severe hour of blackout in the state, when over 20 gigawatts of load was being shed and the state's grid nearly collapsed. In that very hour, the wind supply was so low, it was just one quarter of that expected in extreme emergencies. Further, the grid operator did not stack a gas emergency, sending gas supplies and gas outages down to the lowest modeled level. They did not stack that emergency with a low wind emer emergency, which is how they were able to show that there would be adequate supplies going into a winter in which the greatest blackout in American history occurred. Now, 
it get, gets worse. Not only did they not stack the extreme low gas generation and extreme low wind, the expected addition and subtraction of resources in the Texas grid over the next five years is minus four and plus five gigawatts of gas. That is plus one gigawatt of gas. Certainly enough, not enough to make up for a loss of uh, 15 or 20 gigawatts of gas generators which was what the claim was that it was a gas problem was based around. In addition, the added, uh, the added, say, 20 gigawatts of wind and solar we can expect over the next four years in Texas, all of that wind and solar must displace operation hours and revenue hours for the type of power plant that supposedly we need to find money outside of the market to upgrade and winterize to survive the next uh, 20 year storm. Let me summarize that again. The wind and solar expected to be added to bring us up to 50 or 60 gigawatts of wind and solar in ERCOT instead of just 30 during the blackouts. That 60, that doubling of wind and solar capacity requires feeding with revenue that is supposed to come from a market that itself did not even have enough revenue to incentivize generators to winterize. Now, we, the state is considering passing a requirement that requires the gas generators to winterize. That will require a significant amount of extra investment and belies the claim that Texas, by building the wind and solar, is moving towards decarbonization. Another thing that irritates me about this mainstream line is that the even with this devastating, nearly record-breaking cold, the error that took down one of the four reactors in Texas was extremely fixable. In fact, a mere changing of procedure or of set points of the valve that froze on the outside of the plant would have been sufficient to stop what in, in one perspective is an erroneous shutdown. Certainly, they fixed the valve afterwards, and the, ne the next blizzard is not going, even going to cause that same shutdown. Nuclear had a four-day average capacity factor of 81% output versus installed capacity. Gas and coal each had around 50% versus installed capacity. Ga uh, wind had 13% versus installed capacity. The overperformance of wind was based on that claim that 13% of installed capacity was indeed a few percentage points above the lowest single momentary collapse of power anticipated in the most extreme collapse of wind event. I think I'll probably cut off here and uh, if there are questions about the Texas event, the cost implications and what Texas is doing to survive and recover, please ask. Though for on the last point, I'll say as far as I can tell, no changes are being expected or anticipated. Thank you very much for that, Mark. Well done on keeping in time as well. Um, i just like to remind everyone once again, please keep yourselves on mute. Um, and we're now going to move into the Q&A section um, of, this, uh, of this discussion. Um, just to remind everyone, if you have any questions, please put them into the chat box because the large number of people attending, it's not feasible to be turning on and off microphones. Um, so I will be reading them out. So please write them in the chat, bo chat box and specify to whom the question is intended. Um, so I have, oh, one second, sorry. So we're starting to get a few questions in now. Um, so the first question I can see here is, can someone, okay, so can either of the speakers, I suppose, explain how severe the effect on a network if a complete blackout occurs and how likely is that event? Kieran, I think that question's probably more likely for you. Okay. Um, you're talking about, uh, I, th I think the question is about a total blackout. Is that am I understanding? I imagine so, yeah. Well, first of all, we say that we've never had a total blackout. That doesn't mean they can't happen. South Australia had a, had a total blackout in 2016. Whole system lost. Took about a, most of a day to get it all back again. Um, 
interesting reasons for it. Uh, there was some wind power involved, but primarily there was uh, poor management more than anything else. Uh, Northeast USA and Canada, 2003, one of the biggest outages, uh, blackouts we've ever had. That was due to a transmission fault. Most of the of what we call blackouts are due to shocks to the system rather than inadequate generation. Italy and Switzerland had a, an enormous one in 2003. Italy was, was a lot of Italy was out for more than a day and a half. Uh, I, I slightly disagree in relation to, the, to Texas because I don't think Texas was a blackout. Texas was primarily an adequacy failure, but it was it, the result was so severe that it almost amounted to a blackout at that time. Um, I think Ireland, uh, the, the management of the grid in Ireland is quite sophisticated. It should be understood that. The more wind power uh, and, and renewables one adds to the system, uh, the more one increases uh, what we call non-synchronous generation coming into the system. And that makes it more and more difficult uh, to, keep, to, to, to keep the system resilient, to make sure that it doesn't go down when there's a fault. Now, AirGrid at the moment, I think, has, has been successfully operating with up to about 70% system non-synchronous penetration. This is the highest in the world. Nobody no system anywhere has been able to operate with this kind of uh, level. So it, it's a tremendous, uh, I think, pat on the back from the people who are actually able to do this. Uh, this is not easy to do. It requires a lot of very complicated uh, engineering, and, and Airgrid has done it very successfully and hopes to increase it further. Uh, I think the, the way the system has been managed and with the amount of wind coming onto it, uh, I think it's been managed extremely well. And I, I for one, am not... Uh, afraid of uh, or not don't fear a blackout i do think that uh, load shedding etc would be much more likely if we can't resolve uh, the current situation in relation to the amount of generation we need i mean as, look, let me just give you a simple example um it, it's only a couple of months ago that the um, uh, the cru uh, gave evidence to an Oireachtas committee and they said 2000 megawatts of gas fire generation is needed in short order 2,000 megawatts is a lot of gas fire generation. Are there, you know, is it coming? Where is it? Um, have, have, are there planning applications in for it? I don't know. Uh, but it takes a while to put 2,000 megawatts of gas fire generation in place. And I just, I just question whether it's actually happening at the scale that's necessary at the moment. Thank you very much for that, Kieran. Um, I... Uh, Mark, you didn't have anything to add into that? or Just one moment. It's just uh, during that severe moment of blackout, the grid operators claimed that they were about one minute from losing the Texas grid and in the entirety. Um, Kieran, you may have heard more details from your professional community about that. The key moment was that the stress on the turbines at the Comanche Peak nuclear plant was becoming severe at that part of the, uh, at that part of the grid, be, as those were the largest generators then left and almost no other optional circuits were left, um, the sudden loss of two and a half gigawatts was not considered um, survivable by grid operators and, and they they thought that they were going to lose it. Estimation is that the blackout would have taken, since it hasn't happened before, a full blackout um, would have taken about a month to restore power and depending on how many cascading failures and how much of the emergency, uh, the emergency response was from the rest of the United States and the world, they were looking at maybe, you know, a few tens of thousands of deaths. Thank you for that. Um, I just like to add, so we've received two questions I'm just going to address now. Um, the first one is from Peter. And it's a question about specific capacity factors and specific cost, levelized cost of electricity for nuclear power to make it competitive in Ireland. Um, I would like to say that's a bit deviating from the topic of today's discussion um, from what the two speakers were talking about. But we have covered this quite extensively in a report that we wrote on the topic, which I will link in the chat now. Um, if you'd like to follow up in it, it's in Appendix B. And we would definitely welcome any questions from you or anyone else. Um, about the contents of this report. Sarah, can I say yeah. one thing about LCOE? Yeah. Um, LCOE, LCOE as a metric has been misunderstood and even parasitized by energy experts in the United States and abroad. Um, the LCOE of Texas wind and solar is extremely low. They do not include the 100 billion in costs from the blackout. They do not include the extra uh, 49 billion dollars above expected trading values of electricity during that four-day event. 
Um, and the reason why they do not include that is the same reason why people said it was not wind and solar's fault that there was a blackout is because they said no one expected there to be any wind and solar in an emergency. Meaning the LCOE, to the extent that it describes a system that's supposed to be there through an emergency, is something entirely different than an LCOE that describes a power source that's not expected to produce during any time, any particular time, especially of need. Yeah, the levelized cost of electricity, the LCOE, LCOE is a political tool. Really, it's an instrument. It's not... Um, it does. It does have a lot of faults as well, um, but we do. We use we use the LCOE um, in some respect in the report, and that's described in the report. Um, the other question um, I just like to quickly address is: um, he's asking. Oh, sorry, my chat jumped. Uh, how quickly could a nuclear reactor be built up and running in Ireland if given the go ahead today. Again, this is a little bit outside the scope um, of this webinar, but you might have heard in the introduction, I talked about the 12 plus year time span to begin to begin um, generating electricity from nuclear power in Ireland. Um, this timeline is also mentioned in our report. We believe that uh, Brian Malloy actually answered um, some part of this in the question saying that construction can happen between five and seven years. We would also need to impl or put together the legal framework and regulatory framework um, and establish a regulator in order to run it. So we believe 12 years would be a minimum. But again, this is also in the report. Um, we have a question from Alistair. Um, I think this might be for... Uh, Mark, um, can you give an overview of how countries with nuclear power deal politically with the concept of adequately safe as opposed to absolutely safe with regard to nuclear plants? Yeah, it's a very simple. Most countries getting new nuclear today, especially ones that have not had nuclear, are developing countries that deal with de dangerous disease, death and natural disasters all the time. It means that the energy ministers uh, and the politicians themselves have grown up in a time where even in their childhoods, extremely lethal and deadly events occurred. It means they have an inbuilt sense of what represents a slight risk of a new progress versus the extreme risk of not making progress. Now, in countries that are already rich and already have nuclear, um, most of these countries before the coming winter had no real concept of what a real risk was or wasn't. Is terrorism going to kill us all? Is it only a small risk? In other words, um, politicians very poorly understood tail risk events and the different categories of extreme or highly variable risks. It's not to say that they were all dumb and wrong to look at, say, terrorism or an extreme nuclear plant accident rather than something like a virus or a pandemic or, or blackouts. It's just tail risk is very hard to understand for those who have not had much real world experience. And the beautiful experience of the last 40 years of peace in most of Europe, along with material prosperity, has, uh, we could say, deprogrammed our leaders or even deselected leaders who worried too much about tail risks. And so the answer is, in countries that are really rich, a small group of people care too much about nuclear risks. And the regulators, whose job it is to be concerned with it, and the professionals in the nuclear plants come to their own accommodation based on the amount of outside stress and force they get from the anti-nuclear uh, obsessed parties. Now, to be a little bit less uh, cheeky, I would say that nuclear plants today choose a level of risk as, or a level of initiating event or catastrophe to prepare for that's typically sufficient to destroy much of the population in the rest of the country. In other words, if we had a plant built in Ireland designed to, to survive a Fukushima plus event, that is a 8.0 earthquake and a, and a say 40, 50 foot uh, wave, then that is definitely something that would make the nuclear facility by far the absolute safest location in Ireland. And that an event that would physically challenge the plant on that engineering basis would probably wipe out a good deal of the population of coastal Ireland. That's not to say that you shouldn't be concerned about it. Like I said, the plants are. It's just like, again, at Diablo Canyon in California, I was just there a few days ago looking at that beautiful plant sitting up on a magnificent sea cliff. And an event 
that damages Diablo Canyon in a way that's bad for public health would probably have several million casualties up and down the Central Coast. Okay, uh, very well answered. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, I We have another question um, from Garda. Um, and this one is for you, Kieran. Um, it's regarding what what would the role for local renewable energy, so distributed solar is the example he's giving, um, be in Ireland's energy transition? Kieran, you're a mute there. Um, again, I, I don't profess to be an expert on, on the distribution side, but um, my view is that this, this transition is so challenging that we are going to have to look at every possible technology. And, uh, you know, it, it, there, there is evidence, plenty of evidence that uh, solar technology at the distribution level uh, is useful. There are issues of cost around this. And, uh, you know, how are we going to encourage people to do it or subsidize those costs? Let me just give you an example for a moment. I, I'm, I'm going off the, the original question a little bit. Um, about 12 years ago, the Danes decided they were going to have renewable energy. They were going to move towards wind, offshore wind, and they knew that it was going to cost some money. They did not pretend that this was going to be a costless transition. And so the Danish parliament uh, passed uh, a legislation in relation to tax that basically said we are going to tax household electricity at a fairly substantial level, not 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 uh, industrial, not commercial, because that would interfere with Danish uh, competitiveness, household electricity, and those are the funds that we're going to raise and use to uh, basically subsidize and encourage and do all the things the government should do in order to make that happen. Now, you look at the price of, of household electricity in Denmark, look at it uh, on the Eurostat figures from, uh, say, one year ago, second half of 2020, uh, and look at the tax rates. The Irish tax rates, if you include everything in relation to tax in Ireland, Irish tax rates are about 34% of the basic cost of electricity. What do you think they are in Denmark? Would you believe 210%? That's how much the Danish parliament has agreed that the Danish people will pay on top of their nominal electricity bills to fund the kind of changes that we're making and that they're making. And that's what's necessary. That's the kind of thinking is necessary if you're going to introduce everything from heat pumps to solar energy, the distribution level, all that kind of thing. And I'm thinking of the 160 parliamentarians we have and wondering which one of them is going to introduce legislation to tax domestic electricity in Ireland at a rate of 210%. I really can't think of them at the moment. But that's the kind of question we need to be facing up to. This is what planning is about at the end of the day, if we're to make the kind of changes happen that we want to have happen. Um, I guess in the same thread, then, there's a question about um, in Ireland uh, from Stan Linehan. Um, in Ireland, we also have the problem of excess winds, which has to be curtailed or constrained. Um, and he's asking about the production, the potential for the production uh, of hydrogen through electrolysis in Ireland. Um, I don't know if you have anything else you'd like to add on that, Kieran. Again, I, I'm far from an expert in this. I, I think the idea all sounds uh, very interesting. Uh, I think hydrogen as a vector is likely to come. Um, it, it is particularly uh, adaptable and, and useful, I think, for heavy transport and for shipping. Uh, but none of it is going to be here. We're not going to have any hyd significant hydrogen in the next uh, 10 years, I would have thought. And again, when people say, let's uh, let's make everything hydrogen, let's get rid of gas, let's let's put hydrogen into the into the gas system. You know, they don't realize the first thing you've got to do is change out the burner in every gas-fired appliance you have in the country. That's a pretty expensive job to do. And secondly, a lot of our gas pipelines would suffer from something called hydrogen embrittlement and will not be suitable for the introduction of hydrogen. These are the kind of sensible engineering uh, challenges that one has to overcome. And uh, if one wanted to dis distribute a lot of hydrogen in Ireland, we'd probably want to put in a new hydrogen grid. Uh, that's a pretty expensive thing to have to do. So again, when we say, please, let's have a plan, we want somebody to say, not hydrogen is wonderful, but we would like so much hydrogen, we would like to use it here, and we're going to ship it over there like this, and this is what it's going to cost. 
we don't see any of that at the moment. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I have problems with hydrogen because we don't have a plan for it at the end of the day. That's not to say that it's not going to be useful. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I'd just like to remind everyone, um, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we won't be taking um, hands up, uh, I suppose. Um, I just uh, stand part two is question and I, I suppose Mark this might be for you um, what are the load following capabilities of small modular nuclear reactors um, first of all I'd say that you probably shouldn't distinguish small modular reactors on the basis of load following versus not those are features that you can design for I know that at least one SMR that I think is a, is a very bad idea in terms of the product being offered is being offered on the basis of extreme load following um, so that's one of the features they claim to be offering, and, and the device isn't that great, I don't think. Um, I would say this. Current nuclear reactors, even large ones, can vary their output by as nearly as much as you would like to, is the way I'd put it. There are some levels of output you can do on the regular with very little modification of the plant. There are deeper or faster ramps that you can add down to very low power, 20% power even sometimes for the most extreme cases in France and Germany where the reactor operators have seen fit to modify their plants in order to regularly achieve fast ramps. Um, the, the power percentage per minute or per five minute interval, I would have to follow up and get the exact one because I don't want to get it wrong. That's a pretty critical number here. But su suffice to say, it's quite good. However, um, it shouldn't be necessary. You can simply, you can very easily and rapidly uh, vary the output from a wind turbine. So you just, you don't have to vary the nuclear plant. To do it otherwise is a mere economic or policy choice. It's not any kind of reasonable technical thing to do. It's the only reason why the plants turn down in other countries is to satisfy the, the tax and the subsidy regimes from the wind turbines, not to protect the grid or to have the lowest cost available of power to the society. It's purely just a, a policy choice. So fortunately, it's not going to be that necessary until you have a very significant amount of nuclear past uh, sensible baseline for your society, in which case it's an entirely different question. We're talking about a, a nuclear, a, Fran a, little, a little France off in the Irish Sea at that point, and it's, we can have a discussion about what France does to vary its output. And even better, why bother? Just uh, put another interconnection with the UK and make absolute bank selling them power, assuming they're not capable of um, delivering their nuclear program before you guys are. Okay. Um, Kieran, do you have anything you'd like to add or are you? No, no, no. I think that's comprehensive enough for me. Okay. Um, Mark, I saw that you start, you've answered a question in the chat. I don't know if you'd like to briefly comment to, on it here. Um, about So it's talking about the need for storage of nuclear waste in Ireland. Um, where Ireland to have a nuclear power program? Would you like to make any comment now? Yes. Any so what you have in the chat? Yep. So I'm the luckiest boy in the world. I got to tour Covra a few days ago when I was in, in the low countries. Um, Covra, C-O-V-R-A. I'm not even going to attempt the Dutch. Can't make any sense of Dutch. Um, but it is the Society for the Protection of Radioactive Wastes in uh, in Netherlands. And what they have, they've turned the protection of society from radioactive waste into a beautiful conceptual art and architecture project, um, considering that, uh, you know, there's a, so much money saved up from nuclear facilities to protect waste that it's trivial to hire the absolute best philosophers, thinkers, artists, and architects to help explain to society what to see. When we went in, we were warmly welcomed with tea and coffee and, and breakfast treats. Then we saw uh, the area where school groups are given an introduction to radiation. We saw the Radiation Museum, including, and this is the reason you must plan a trip to the south, south of Netherlands as soon as possible, the most beautiful bubble chamber accessible to the public anywhere in the world, as far as I know. So this is an area about a meter square where you can see cosmic particles enter the room and leave tracks in the, in the gases based on the type of radiation. After that is used to educate children of all ages about what types of radiation are needing to be protected and what type of waste. Then you go to the architectural models and diagrams of the facility. And then right after that, you get led 
to the facilities themselves, which also double as art storage areas for the local museums as part of a, a just sort of a generous uh, gift to the to the nearby museums who needed climate controlled storage space. You see the intermediate level waste canisters. You can walk right by them. They let you do everything but actually touch. They prefer you not. And then you walk into the high level waste area where they roll back a large thick door about this thick that moves very slowly. And then you're able to walk directly on top of the high level nuclear waste repatriated from the reprocessing plants in France where the Dutch send their fuel to get a 50 per, 50% more, um, well, 100% more juice out of the uranium that's mined for Dutch plants. Getting to walk on top of the nuclear waste and in this gorgeous brand new facility um, where, you know, in terms of timing, what they're doing with waste is that they're saying, if they know they certify the facility for about 100 years at a time, they plan to hold a conference each 20 years to recertify for the next 100. And they're going to do that in a rolling pattern. Always have the option if Dutch society decides that at the end of that 100 years, it's best to spend 30 billion euros on a hole in the ground. I, my, my suggestion is that they won't do that once they're seeing the living beautiful waste storage facility, they'll say, why would we spend 30 billion euros on that when we could just keep walking on the waste um, for the next hundred? Then that is able to allay the anxieties that have been brought up by the uh, anti-nuclear movement and by genuinely worried populace. That intimate connection with the waste, including like reaching down and feeling the floor and feeling the sensible heat just from the convective airflow around the high level nuclear waste drums, that physical connection with the waste is all that it's going to take for the Dutch to just lose their fear of the issue, spend only a few billion each decade, um, a trivial amount compared to the power of a national fleet if they build it out, is done. That's uh, All you guys just need to go see that waste, whether you don't like nuclear or you do like nuclear, because it's one of the most thought-provoking experiences you'll have in your lives. <laughs> Okay, well, that's been added to my next holiday list. Thank you very we'll much. Get you, uh, we know the, the manager, the guy who dreamt it up, so we'll just get you access. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, uh, we have one short question, um, and then I'm just going to wrap up. We'd like to end sharply at eight. So um, from Tim, um, Maltex Canada are developing a molten salt reactor to burn up waste. Um, are there any views on that from either speaker? Just if you have any quick thoughts. Again, I, 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 leave, I leave that one to Mark if you don't mind. He's the expert in this area. Of course. All right. So I will say that a working successful example of a Maltex type reactor would be a, a very interesting accomplishment. Among other things, it would provide high temperature uh, heat. Almost every type of reactor or experimental reactor has been tried. The ones that developed were a combination of luck, first mover advantage, heavy investment by big industrial groups. But um, the whole thing is we know that today's light water reactors and heavy water reactors physically last for up to a century. That's an extraordinary advantage. The Moltex thought is that the high temperature and possible corrosive activity of the internals are less of a problem if you replace parts every decade or whatever. If that model works, it would be very interesting. There's absolutely no chance that there are any more people who are convinced nuclear is okay because Moltex are there, if, that it would not also be convincible with light water reactors. I think it's very cool that one of the head officers of Moltex is Irish. I think that's nothing to be taken lightly. National involvement and national pride in nuclear is one of the top ways that a country has a concern um, and an investment, emotional investment, that's strong enough to counter the anti-nuclear forces that are certain to gather the moment a nuclear program is announced. I personally see stronger opportunities elsewhere. I personally welcome them well. The moment a reactor program that like, like that gets started, it's no longer an experiment. It's an actual brother in arms in the, in the race to get the best nuclear systems. Until then, I think it's probably safe to say that my professional engineering judgment is a little bit more uh, cautious about the reactor types that are furthest from what we absolutely for sure know could operate at 90% or higher capacity factor for a century in Ireland. 
Okay, thank you. And I've received one anonymous question just very quickly for Kieran. Um, do you see there being an increased risk of blackouts in Ireland, especially in the next decade? You're on mute there, Kieran. I think I've already covered that issue. There are risks. This is all, there are no black, no black and white in any of this. This is all about managing risk at the end of the day. Uh, I think we haven't done a very good job of managing the short-term risks. Remember, go back two years, uh, air grid forecasts, uh, their executive summary on, their, on the generation capacity statement. Key message number one, quote, the all-island demand is increasing and is forecast to increase significantly largely due to the expected expansion of large energy users such as data centers. At a median demand level, that is not adequate generation capacity to meet demand from 2026 on an all-island basis once money point closes at the end of 2025. And I went on basically to list here a lot of risks to the system. And you expect to get some, um, you know, something uh, be done to sort of mitigate these risks. And the problem is that we, we don't really see the plan in place to mitigate these risks at the moment. And uh, if we don't mitigate these risks, we will certainly have problems going forward. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that the, the issues that I've identified early on here are going to get fixed. But if they don't, then we are going to have problems. Okay, thank you very much for that um, quick answer there. Um, I'm just going to wrap up. Um, thank you very much to both of our speakers today. This is incredibly interesting and a much needed discussion in Ireland. And also thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. There was massive interest in this topic. I've seen over 90 people have joined um, this discussion at some point tonight. Um, to reiterate what I said at the beginning, Ireland urgently needs to assess all energy technologies for the role they may play in an affordable, clean and stable future Irish electricity grid. However, until the ban on nuclear power is lifted, it's not possible for it to be assessed on equal footing with other energy technologies for how it could help our electricity system. Given the urgent nature of this conversation and the 12 plus year time span it would take to begin producing electricity in an Irish nuclear power plant, it is essential that we have the conversation now about what we would need from our future energy system and how that could be provided. 18 for Zero is a voluntary group of energy sector professionals advocating for the repeal of this legislation to enable this conversation. We're going to be holding another discussion on the 2nd of November on the development of nuclear power programme in Ireland from a workforce and people perspective. And we'll email you all about this when the registration opens. So we really hope you can join us on the 2nd of November. And in the meantime, you can find us on LinkedIn, Twitter and Instagram and at 18 zeroie where you can also find our report on nuclear energy development in Ireland. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining.